Hello, and welcome to Johns Hopkins Medicine online webinar series. Today, Johns Hopkins interventional cardiologist John Thompson will be speaking about innovations in pediatric congenital heart defect treatment. Before we get started, we'd like to provide some user tips so that you are comfortable using this platform. The first 30 minutes of our program will include an informative presentation by our presenter. The last 30 minutes will be dedicated to our live Q&A session. To submit a question, please type your question into the Q&A box and click send. Your questions will be seen by others watching this presentation, so please note if you do not want your name attached to your question, please check send anonymously. We will do our best to answer all the questions we receive during the Q&A session. Alternatively, you can email us questions and feedback to hopkinsseminars at jhmi.edu. Please note this program is being recorded. At the end of the webinar, we would greatly appreciate receiving your feedback and ask that you complete our survey. A pop-up window will appear at the end of our program for you to complete the survey. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Thompson to begin his presentation. Hello, good morning and welcome to everyone that's logged on. First of all, I'd really like to thank Helen, Amy and Chelsea who have done all of the hard work putting this, this together. Um, so I've got a um, hopefully what should be um, a fairly um, sh short to medium sized presentation on innovation in the treatment of congenital heart disease, which I'm going to share now. So uh, hopefully you should be seeing some slides. And if not, then if somebody could shout out and tell me um, if there's a problem. And actually, you know, this has been quite fun for me because it's allowed me to sit and think about the specialty that I work in, which is without a doubt an incredible specialty. Um, and what I figured was um, that I'm gonna talk to you a little bit, I'm gonna tell you a story. And I think that this story is about treatment of for some forms of congenital heart disease. And I think it shows just how important this area is in, in medicine. And then secondly, I'll, I'll just run through an area that we're um, developing and has developed quite a lot over the last couple of years, um, which I think will, uh, affects um, a, a patient group that previously we, we were unable to treat. So um, without further ado, um, this is um, a slide of a timeline of, of, of catheterization. So believe it or not, the first catheter was done by this gentleman in the top corner, a guy called Forsman, who was a German urologist, um, not, not a cardiologist. And he worked out that he could put um, a tube from his arm into the heart in the uh, late 1920s. <clears throat> he was rewarded for that discovery by being sacked by his boss for not doing what he should have been doing. But he really started things. And then it wasn't really until the late 60s that William Rashkind, Bill Rashkind of CHOP, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, did the first procedure on a heart through a keyhole uh, approach. And that was a septostomy, effectively making a little tear between the, um, <clears throat> between the um, two filling chambers of the heart in babies with transposition of the great vessels. And this kept those babies alive while they were waiting for surgery. Coronary angiography came over a decade later. And then I put this in because I think it's it's both important and nice. This lady is Jean Can, and Jean Can is one of my predecessors. She was the director of catheterization here at Hopkins um, before I was. And in 1982, she did the world's first procedure where she stretched a valve in the heart. And this really did, um, this really was the beginning, I, I guess, of mainstream cath intervention for kids with congenital heart disease. And I put in uh, this in addition, this is the Amplatzer device, which came to um, the open market in 1996. It sort of corresponds with my career in this area, really. I, I remember the early days of the Amplatzer device, and this is Kurt Amplatz who's a radiologist who invented the device. And it, it, it's hard to exaggerate how important his invention was because it ushered in the era of modern cath intervention. Things changed massively uh, from 
from the period of the Amplatzer device. I think it, it it gave us confidence to do things. I think we we uh, innovated, and things really did explode in this area, and it became um, the cutting edge of medical technology. Really, all thanks to that development for closure of a hole in the heart. Um, and I think that in a way, this is a little bit of the story that I'm going to tell you. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you about is how some of the, the, the things that happened in that period of time became a real catalyst for lots of things in medicine, some very important areas of clinical medicine that, that, that sprung from the innovation that happened in, 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 in that period. And this is what I'm going to talk about first. This um, man on the left is Philip Bonhoeffer. Um, Philip is a colleague of mine, uh, or was a colleague of mine in London. Um, he's a concert level violinist and has now retired and makes violins in Tuscany, Italy. So he's he's given up medicine. He's also the nephew of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was the, the great anti-Nazi Lutheran priest in the Second World War who stood up to Hitler. Um, and Philip, like all of us, during the 1980s and the 1990s, we became aware that pulmonary incompetence or leak through the pulmonary valve was a real problem. Um, and this is a, a rough graph showing what happens to patients' right heart when they're exposed to this leak. And the yellow lines are when a valve is replaced and, and, and you can see that, that many of these patients are having to have that done very frequently. And Philip had the idea of, you know, what, what he, he um, uh, and for those patients that are on this call, many of you will be familiar with this. This is a stenotomy scar. This is the what happens and what the observable element after cardiac surgery. And not surprisingly, patients don't want to have that done if they don't, if they don't have to. And in addition, having repeat operations carries a, a, a burden, a burden of risk. Every time we reoperate, then we expose that patient to, to, to a risk of complications occurring. And Philip's great idea and his contribution was this. Um, so this, this, this thing on the left-hand side, this, this um, circular structure is a valve. Um, and above that is a banner from Philip's publication in the Lancet Journal in 2000, where he described the first keyhole insertion of a valve into a human being. Um, and this was to help a conduit, a tube that had been put in by a surgeon. And, and, and Philip hand sewed the vein from, a, a, um, from a, a cow into a metal stent and that folded up onto the onto a tube and he was able to put that into the lung artery. And this effectively got rid of the pulmonary incompetence. Um, and talk about, you know, the, the face launching a thousand ships. Um, this um, rapidly became standard of care for several reasons. One, um, it, it saved the risk of, of an open heart operation. But two, very rapidly, it was it was very clear to us that when offered a choice between a reoperation and a valve doing doing this, patients always would prefer to have um, a, a keyhole or a transcath procedure than than an operation. Um, so this is just an example. These are some pictures from from a cath lab of a uh, of a little boy, uh, and you can see here that there is. Um, calcified or, 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 or there's a line here outlining the surgical tube that was put in and that tube is not working very well. Um, it's narrow and it's leaking. And then after one of Philip's valves goes in, it's a better size and the leak is gone. So that's an example of, of one of these valves going in. Uh, and that patient was home the next day and obviously had uh, was pretty much back to normal by the following week was back to school so um this is i guess where it gets um philosophical what did that lead to well it led to a lot the work that philip did in the late 90s and published in 2000 led directly to this and this picture on the right is a TAVA, which means a transcatheter aortic valve replacement. 
Um, and so he showed that we could replace valves. And this was then taken and, uh, and developed for another valve in the heart, um, initially for older people who were too ill to have a surgical operation. But now we've shown that, that it's a better procedure than surgical valve replacement, even for low risk people. Um, so for everything, having this sort of valve versus an, an open valve stitched in that more patients survive having this valve and they have less complications. So it's a better treatment. And it, it it's a big deal. Here in the United States in 2019, there were over 73,000 TAVAs performed. And that's against under 60,000 um, surgical valves. So there are more of these valves going in than there are open heart operations to have the valve replaced. And in terms of what it means, it launched an industry. Um, the best figures that I have are that this is about a $3 billion industry per year. So this is huge numbers, huge money. And that sort of money um, is a big deal. Uh, from TAVA and, and directly from Philip's work, work the era of structural heart intervention was born. So prior to this, adult cardiologists had really um, fixed narrowings in coronaries related to heart attacks. But from this work, there's been an explosion of keyhole treatments to treat other valve problems, to treat leaks around valves, to deal with narrowings, um, to deal with enlarged blood vessels. This is probably the most active area in modern medicine. And it all came from Philip's idea, the, the stitching of that jugular vein into a stent back in the late 90s. And it really is, you know, it's, it's, it's huge. It's a behemoth. Um, the structural intervention is enormous. It goes on in virtually every center in every country of the world, all, all realized because of this. And I think really importantly, everything comes back full circle because all of that um, uh, volume and expertise means that there is help for us. It feeds back into the treatment of kids with heart problems. So we have luckily the, the, the structural intervention dollar means that there is fundamental research that, that really helps as a side effect, the children that we treat. So everything comes back to the to the beginning. Um, and um, although, frankly, we only get the crumbs from the table because we're a small specialty dealing with small numbers of patients, we're able to leverage that expertise and that, that knowledge and that money to really help kids with congenital heart problems. And that all is down to Philip Bonhoeffer. And an example of this, this is a valve that was made for TAVA. It's bigger than the Melody valve, which only goes up to 22 millimeters. And this one goes up to 29. And we've been able to take this valve and put it into children with heart problems with larger outflow tracks that wouldn't have been suitable for the Melody. And here's an Edwards valve in place doing exactly the same job in a child who would otherwise have needed to go for an operation. And even then, th these valves are not necessarily big enough for what we need. The majority of the children and, and young adults that we see that have, have had surgical repair as, as infants and children for tetralogy of fallow have outflow tracts that are more than 29 millimeters. And so that Edwards valve isn't big enough for them. And so that same structural industry that's grown up in this new specialty has given us, one might even say gifted us, because there's not much money in this area compared to, to TAVA, but they have used the technology to make bigger valves for the pulmonary artery. And here's some examples. So Medtronic, who uh, make the Melody valve, have come up with another valve called the Harmony valve. You'll notice the, uh, the link there, and, and it's called Melody and Harmony because of Philip's interest in music. Um, and this copes with much bigger outflow tracks, as does this. This is this is from Edwards, uh, and and this is um, a, 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 a cotton reel that we can put into the outflow tract, which acts as a holder.
for the 29 Edwards and effectively expands up the size that it can, can cope with. Both of these are FDA approved and both of these are in routine use. We use these, if not weekly, at least two to three times a month in children with heart problems. And then finally, although this isn't available in the States, when I was working in England, um, we had a valve called the P-valve, which came out of TAVA technology for the pulmonary artery. And I used a lot of these. It's very similar to the other two. It's a good valve. So we have a number of different things available to us for, um, for, to help these patients. Uh, and, I, and just on this little section, I'm going to talk about something else after this. But what I would say is that I, I, I wrote a similar talk probably about five years ago, and I said it's likely that this technology um, um, will um, completely replace surgical valve replacement. And I've changed that, actually. Uh, I should, it shouldn't say not completely. It should be completely. Uh, I would change that and say that I think it's inconceivable now, given the innovation and the money and investment in this area, that this technology will not completely replace surgery for these valves within the next decade, save for very tiny babies and children who aren't big enough to take the, the tubes in, in the blood vessels. And that just leaves us with how long the valves will last. So I think that's a very, um, you know, very, very exciting story and a real change over my, my career. The second thing I'm going to talk about is this, because this is another exciting area, which I think is, is um, just starting to move quickly. And that's closing connections in babies that are unfortunate, unfortunate enough to be born early and premature. Um, normally, this is a procedure that we do in, in, in standard kids. Um, it's nearly always done in the cath lab. It's usually done in children that are more than five kilos and it's routine. Um, uh, the ducts that we treat have a particular appearance. This is an angiogram, a picture of a duct, and you can see it's slightly conical. Um, and and, and uh, that's what we're used to seeing. But obviously, if we start to move down to this premature group, these babies are very different. They're tiny. They're very young, they're very fragile, and they always have multiple illnesses. Um, they have um, problems related to the duct. It causes all sorts of issues. I won't spend a long time going through this, but pretty much everything that a premature baby suffers with is made worse by having a duct. Uh, and this is uh, a paper written by, this is my old cath colleague, Jamie Bentham. Um, from England. And Neil Wilson, the last author, was, is a great friend of mine um, who came up with the idea of modifying these connection uh, plugs to close ducts in premature infants. And th they did this work together when they were working at the John Radcliffe in Oxford. And this is them doing this on a neonatal unit. So they actually went into the, the neonatal unit and closed these, these connections in these babies. And this is actually x-rays that Neil gave me of his first patient that he treated. So on the left, you can see an x-ray that's fuzzy. The lungs look um, uh, do not look normal. They should look black and clear. Um, and that's before the duct was closed. And less than 24 hours on the right after the duct's closed, you can see these lungs are starting to improve. It probably is a mortality risk, but I'm not going to dwell on this because I think that we're not entirely sure about what it means for babies' survival. We think that babies with ducks do worse and are more likely to die, but that's a complicated question which we're trying to answer at the moment. It's always difficult to know which premature baby with a duct is should be closed. Um, it's hard sometimes to know when it's really significant. Um, we don't really know when we should observe and when we should treat. And we don't really know whether we should try other forms of treatment. So there are other medical drug treatments that occasionally can work. Um, so there is plenty of unknown unknowns in, in, in PDA closure, but for sure, if I can get this to work, why is it not wanting to go? 
We come out of that and just go on to that and see if that wants to work. Yeah, the ducts are also different in terms of their shape. And as a result, the um, a company have made a plug specifically for these little babies. It can be used in babies who are 700 grams or more, so really tiny, really tiny. Um, that's a picture of the plug on, on a quarter. Um, and it's give, it's deployed through a small system and probably takes about 20 to 30 minutes. We have to do the procedure slightly differently. Uh, we avoid the artery, so we don't go through the, the arterial system. We don't give heparin and we do most of our checks using ultrasound. So, in fact, what we're looking at is this rather than the angiograms. And this is a plug in place in a duct with a really, really nice result. This is one of the early uh, closures. There are practical difficulties, you know, moving little babies around. These premature babies get cold. Our cath labs aren't really designed for babies like this, but we are um, better at that. And it can be done. You know, I think we have good evidence that it can be done and it can be done safely. And I'd say that in some areas of the states, it's now verging on standard of care. We're probably behind the curve a little bit in Maryland. There's been relatively few kids that have had this done, but it has worked. And I think it's going to grow as the people that are the main carers for these children. So neonatologists and primary pediatricians believe that it's the right thing for their patients. So I have taken there just over 20 minutes and I've done a quick run through just a couple of aspects of, of what is a wonderful area, you know, an area that has fulfilled its promise of helping kids with congenital heart disease, of improving their lives, improving how long they live and doing that at a lower cost to those children. So they're not having to undergo heavy old fashioned surgery. Um, it's continually changing and it's continually developed. And I'm sure that that will, will carry on. Um, the, if the next 30 years are as interesting as the last 30 years, it'll be fascinating. And I really hope that we carry on proving people wrong. Many people said to me, oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. It's not possible. And many of those things are now routine. So that's really all I have to say. So thank you very much for listening. I'll head, hand back now to um, the guys, the guys on, on the other side and stop sharing. And um, I'm happy to take any questions that anyone's got. If I can stop sharing, there we are. Great. Now you should be back to me, not the slides. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. Um, we'll move into the Q&A portion here, like you said. If anyone wants to submit a question, please follow the directions on the screen. And Dr. Thompson, we have a first question coming through the chat on your screen. Yeah, okay, great. So there's a question here, it's asking a really, really good question. Is there a difference in the quality of life with having an open heart procedure compared to a minimally invasive procedure? Um, and Whilst on the surface of that, that's a really that's a, a fairly simple question. Actually, it's quite complex because everything that that I do, everything that any proceduralist does is about weighing up the risk and the benefit for a patient or a family. Um, and so whenever we bring in an, a, a, a minimally invasive or a cath procedure, there's it always has to be compared to the standard, which is open heart surgery. Uh, and sometimes we don't know the answer to that question. Is, it, is there a difference in quality of life? Is this better than the open heart procedure uh, at, at the beginning? Which is why with the TAVA procedure, it started on, on patients that had no other choices. And then gradually, as we start to understand how they compare, then by and large, lower risk patients will be brought in. But I think that that just expanding on, on that, um, you know, I think that there is no doubt that once a, 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 a minimally invasive cath procedure is shown to be 
equal to an open heart procedure, then um, patients and their families generally want that procedure. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Um, then there's an, the next question that's come through is, when should a patient and their family seek, and, seek a second opinion for minimally invasive procedure? Um, well, I think what I would say are there are still some things that we can't do in the cath lab. Um, there are procedures that, that or, or, or problems, heart problems that we can't treat. So um, it's quite possible that if you've been, you or your child has been referred for an open heart procedure, it's possible, even likely, that that's the only procedure that's available to them. But I think that modern medicine, we as doctors should never be afraid of patients asking for second opinions. I think that, that the important thing is that when we go into a procedure, it needs to be a partnership um, that, um, the, the, that a family is fully informed and that we um, have explored all of the issues around the procedure. And then once we're happy and we're at the jumping off point, we get on and do the procedure as well as we possibly can. But that work up to having the procedure, it's essential that a, that a patient and or their family has all the information they feel they need in order to make the decision to have it done. Okay, Helen, can you? Okay, um, uh, so there's a few more questions coming in. Does minimally invasive procedure mean less pain? Um, there's an easy answer to that, and, and it is yes. Um, the truth is that having a scar on the chest is painful. Most kids actually recover from the scar of open heart surgery quite quickly, but there's no doubt that it is sore and painful and the uh, cath alternative is through a tiny, tiny little hole, um, less than, much less than an eighth of an inch at the top of the leg, which heals very quickly. So I think th there's no doubt that it's more comfortable. Um, there's a question asking how long is the recovery after, after a cath or a minim minimally invasive procedure? Uh, the answer to that is it depends on the procedure. Um, sometimes we send people home the same day. M probably more often than not, they'll stay overnight just so we can observe them. We'll check the result on, on, on an echo scan the next day and they'll go home the next day. Uh, and then normally I'll say to a family, look, just you know, take it easy for a day or two but I would fully expect a child to be back to normal by later that week or the following week. Okay. For patients that experienced an open heart surgery and later a cath procedure, did they notice a major difference during the recovery? Um, well, yes, is the answer. Um, if you have open heart surgery, then the earliest realistically we're going to get you in and out of hospital is five days and sometimes it's much longer than that and for um cath you're in and out within 24 hours almost without exception and then the recovery after that is all about after surgery is recovering from the fact that you've got a, a scar on the chest and that's painful when you move you feel that the pain as we all know if, we, if anyone that's ever had an operation before or even hurt themselves, you know that when you move that area that's been um, cut and is healing, it's painful. So that takes time. And in some cases, it can take months for that, for that scar to fully come back to normal. People can have problems and soreness until, and, until it's recovered and that can take months. So it, it, it's a, um, you know, it's, it's variable, but for sure, um, for sure, uh, recovery is longer after surgery. Um, okay. Um, how often are follow-up procedures needed after receiving the first minimally invasive surgery? Um, well, it depends on what's being done. 
some um, some procedures um, are a one off. We do them. We would generally see the patient in the outpatient clinic once after the procedure and then hand them back to their primary cardiologist and follow up would just be routine after that. There are other problems that may need more than one cath. It's possible that we'll have to do more than one cath to get all the work that we need done done. Um, and, and likewise, it's possible that there are there are some patients that may need to be seen more often. Um, but as a general rule, we, we normally um, are seeing somebody after the procedure a, a few months down the line and then handing them back to their normal cardiologist. OK. Um, so I'm being asked, um, so this really is talking about the valve procedure I was describing and saying, can the heart valve experience any additional leaks after receiving the procedure? And the answer to that is yes. The best valve in the heart is your own valve. So your own valve has the best chance of, of lasting for the longest. Any artificial valve, be that a valve put in by open heart surgery or minimally invasive surgery, is artificial. And it will, at some point, wear out, particularly in a child where we're hoping that, you know, we'll, we'll be looking at 50, 60 years of, of, of life in addition to the childhood. So, yes, the valves can deteriorate and can require treatment and replacement again in the future. But... One of the good things about the, the minimally invasive valves is that when they wear out, we can usually put another valve of a similar sort inside them and, and, and refresh the valve, if you like. Okay, um, are the different anesthesia options for the procedure? Um, well, the simple answer to that is yes. But of course, it does depend on two things. It depends on the sort of procedure that we're doing and the patient that we're treating. So obviously, a four-year-old needing a procedure is very different to a 40-year-old. Um, and you can't realistically expect a small child to stay still for a procedure. So um, that the, 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 the type of patient matters and the procedure that we're doing matters. For some things, we can we can use very light anesthesia or sedation if we're doing something that's relatively straightforward. But if we're doing bigger work, for example, putting a valve in, I need that patient still so we don't have a critical point in the procedure where the patient moves and it, and it, and it causes a problem. So the, yes, there are options, but they depend on what we're doing and, and to whom. Um, do I see more minimally invasive procedures being offered in the future? Unequivocally, without a doubt, yes. You know, I think that the story of structural cardiac intervention, I think the surprising thing is how much we've managed to conquer over such a short period of time. And I think the, the lesson is that, that, that human beings are, are it, 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 ingenious. Uh, and once the right minds and the right resources are targeted at a problem, we usually find some form of solution. So I think that by the time I retire in in whenever that may be, 15 years time, I think this will look this whole area will look different again. And then a generation on, I would be surprised if there were all that many things that were still being done open, actually. Um, how helpful is cardiac MRI prior to valve replacement? Um, uh, very helpful. Um, it, it's one thing doing the procedure and the plumbing that comes with doing the procedure. The other side is making the right decisions and making sure that we're doing the procedure on somebody that needs to have it done. And the MRI is critical in that. It gives us information about the size and function of the heart, how everything is working and, and, and all of the parameters for selecting people 
for um, a minimally invasive valve are all based on MRI information. So it's extremely unusual for us not to have an MRI on, on, on a child or an adult that might need a valve replacement. Um, so we have um, all of the technology that's available um, to anyone else. We have excellent MRI. We have particularly good CT, which is an X-ray based imaging, which gives me incredible three dimensional images. And then we have a cath lab that's set up for dealing with with children, um, which will um, uh, the plan, the tentative plan is to rebuild that cath lab. We're going to build a, a, a new fancy cath lab in the next couple of years in order to give us the very most up to date cath equipment. But we have everything available to us that anyone else would have anywhere in the world. So I'm being asked about lifestyle changes. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm um, of the view that I'm here to do procedures in order to not only give children length of life, but quality of life. And so I try very, very hard to get patients back to normal. You know, I want them to exercise. I want them to do things. Um, there are some things that we might say, you know, for example, if you have a major heart problem and you've needed valves replacing, we might say to you, we don't want you to be a professional uh, American football player because we're worried about somebody crashing into your chest. I I'd say that's common sense, really. But almost anything else, my aim would be to get you back to at least what you were doing before or better. And I really don't want to be restricting kids. And as we all know, it's hard to restrict kids anyway because they do what they want. But I think that um, um, we try hard to uh, to improve patients' lives. Um, one or two other things, lifestyle changes. We get anxious about tattoos and piercings. And the reason for that is that they can introduce infection, which if it gets into the heart can be extremely serious. So I guess if that's a lifestyle issue, then that would be something I would ask um, people and families to avoid but everything everything else we would try and work with you to get the very very most out of the heart and the very mo most out of a child's life and the final question so far so we're a little bit um i'm a little bit ahead of time um are there any limitations during the recovery process well um, we uh, there are a few limitations around driving if you've had certain things done and you're an adult that drives a car depending on the procedure depending on the um, uh, 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 on the patient we can we can um, there can be mandatory limitations to what you can do for a period of time we generally ask people as I say when they go home the day after the procedure just to take it easy for a day or two there is a little hole at the top of the leg. It, we will be sure that it's, it's, it's sealed over, but it makes no sense to pressure that little hole and risk a bleed. So I think that it's wise to have um, a little bit of time taking it easier than you perhaps normally would with the aim of the following week being back to full, full gas. Um, and then limitations otherwise are very much procedure dependent, depending on what we've done will give you a tailored set of recommendations about what you should and shouldn't be doing and for how long. So you shouldn't go home not knowing. If you don't know, then we've not done our job properly and we'd need you to shout out and say, look, tell me, tell me what I can do and what what, what I what I can't do. Um, so um, yeah, I think that probably answers that. So anyone, any other questions? I feel like I've whizzed through all of those and maybe have made no sense at all, but please, if anyone has questions, just shout out.
think we've gone through everything. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson, for your presentation. And thank you so much, everyone, for attending today's webinar. A uh, recording of the presentation will be emailed out to everyone. And we hope you have a great day. All right. Thank you very much.